Okay, so you want to dive into this Steve Lawson situation, right? Right. Got to admit, it's a uh, kind of doozy. Yeah. It's not just, you know, another news cycle. This is hitting close to home for a lot of people. Yeah. Especially, you know, within certain Christian communities. Mm -hmm. So, from the articles you sent, it seems like the gist is this. Thank you. Steve Lawson, and you probably know the name, pastor, author, big in reformed evangelical circles, accused of having an affair. Right. And that's led to his removal from ministry, and it's causing, well, you know, all sorts of ripples. Good time. We've even got some user comments uh, attached to the Protextia article, which gives us a little glimpse into how people are reacting. Yeah, it's been something. you got to remember, Lawson wasn't just a pastor. He was a leading voice in the reformed evangelical world. Mm. So when someone of his stature falls, it sends shockwaves, you know? Right. This isn't just about one man's actions. It makes people question leadership, accountability, their faith even. Yeah, it's like the whole foundation gets a little shaky. Exactly. And then you start looking at the institutions involved, and it gets even more kind of, I don't know. Murky. Yeah, murky. Trinity Bible Church, the yep. Master's Seminary. Grace Community Church Lawson wasn't just a member. He held positions of power in each of these places. Mm -hmm. But here's something that, I don't know, really jumped out at me from the Protestor article. Lawson's connection with this woman, it allegedly stemmed from her being part of Grace Community Church, yeah. not directly as his student at the seminary. Interesting. They made it a point to say it was the church connection, mm -hmm. not his teaching role, that initially brought them together. That's a crucial detail. It makes you wonder about the timeline, you know, the nature of their relationship. Did this develop solely during his time in Dallas? Or if they knew each other prior because of her family's ties to Grace Community Church? Right. Does it suggest a blurring of lines that might have begun much earlier? It's like suddenly there's this whole other layer of history we need to consider. Right. And then you factor in the claim about Lawson allegedly funding her travel. Mm-hmm. The sources mention he traveled a lot for ministry, which on the surface seems, you know, yeah. normal for a pastor of his stature. But when you connect the dots. Yeah, it makes you wonder if that frequent travel, which often comes with a degree of autonomy, less oversight. Right. Might have provided cover for an affair. Yeah. It's not uncommon, unfortunately. Yeah. OK, so we've got potential power dynamics, questions about the timeline, and now the possibility of Lawson using his position and resources for something, you know, completely inappropriate. Mm -hmm. What's the reaction been like from these institutions? Because from what I'm reading, it's been pretty quiet. Yeah, very much so. The sources point out a deafening silence from Trinity Bible Church, Grace Community Church, even ministries like Ligonier and G3, where Lawson was, you know, a prominent figure. Are we talking about a potential cover up here? It's certainly a question worth asking. Uh, the lack of transparency is concerning, to say the least. Right. When institutions remain silent, especially in situations as serious as this, it naturally raises red flags. The Protestia article even mentions whispers of whistleblowers who allegedly tried to raise concerns about Lawson's behavior, mm. but face pushback. Now, they haven't confirmed those claims, but the mere possibility is, I don't know, it's chilling. It is. If there's any truth to that, it suggests a systemic issue within these institutions. Think about it. If people tried to speak up and were silenced, what does that say about the culture? Yeah. Are these institutions prioritizing their image over protecting individuals and pursuing truth? That's a heavy thought. It's like you want to believe these organizations, especially those founded on faith, would be motivated by you know, a higher standard. You would hope so. But the reality is institutions are made up of people. Right. And people are flawed. Power dynamics exist everywhere. And sometimes those in power are more concerned with self-preservation than with doing what's right. It's a tough pill to swallow, that's for sure. Yeah. Makes you question the systems we have in place. Like, if someone like Lawson can operate this way, what does that say about the checks and balances or lack thereof within these institutions? Exactly. And on that note, Let's shift gears a bit and talk about another ethically complex aspect of this story. The decision to protect the woman's identity. Okay. Protestia chose to honor her family's request for privacy 
but the comments on the article are all over the map. Yeah, it's a tough one. Some argue that by concealing her identity, you're creating a double standard and shielding her from you know, the court of public opinion. Right. Whereas others say it's about protecting the vulnerable, especially when there's such a clear power imbalance. It's true that transparency and accountability often involve uncovering uncomfortable information about all parties involved. Right. But on the other hand, we have to acknowledge the power dynamics at play here. Of course. Lawson, with his platform and influence, undoubtedly held a position of authority over this woman. So the question becomes, is it fair to expose her to the same level of public scrutiny? Yeah, it's like, where do you even begin to draw the line? You've got the argument for full transparency and holding everyone accountable for their choices. But then there's the side that emphasizes protecting the less powerful, mm -hmm. especially when there's such a clear imbalance. It's a classic ethical dilemma, and there's no easy answer. Mm. Do we prioritize the public's right to know, or do we prioritize the individual's right to privacy? Mm. And in cases like this, where there's a significant power differential, that question becomes even more complex. It really makes you think about how we, as a society, handle these types of situations, mm. particularly in the age of social media and instant judgment. Right. It's a different world out there. But let's bring it back to the sources for a moment. Mm -hmm. I noticed that they mentioned the biblical story of the woman caught in adultery. Oh, interesting. It's like they're prompting us to consider the parallels and ask ourselves some hard questions. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting they bring that story up because it's so often used to shame and condemn, especially women who've made mistakes. Right. But what people often miss is the context. Mm -hmm. Jesus, in that moment, challenged the hypocrisy of those ready to stone the woman while completely ignoring the man's involvement, mm. he forced them to confront their own judgment and prejudice. It's like he was saying, let's not pretend this is a simple issue of right and wrong. It's like he was saying, let's not pretend this is a simple issue of right and wrong. Yeah. There's always more to the story. Exactly. Right? And that's why this story resonates so strongly with the situation at hand. It compels us to look beyond the surface, to consider the complexities of human relationships and the danger of rushing to judgment without understanding the full picture. We've covered a lot of ground in this first part of our deep dive. The allegations, the potential cover-up, the power dynamics, and even some biblical parallels. But stick with us because in part two, we're gonna dig even deeper into those institutional roles and the systems that may have allowed this situation to occur and potentially remain hidden for so long. Picking up where we left off, let's unpack these institutional roles a bit further. You mentioned Lawson's positions at Trinity Bible Church, the Master Seminary, and Grace Community Church. To truly understand how this situation unfolded, we have to look at the power dynamics inherent within these institutions. It's like those diagrams with the concentric circles, right? Right. Lawson's right there in the middle and the influence just ripples outward. Exactly. So how do you see those dynamics playing out in this case? Well, let's start with his role as pastor. This position, I mean, it automatically comes with a great deal of spiritual authority. Right. People look to him for guidance, trust his judgment mm -hmm. often, you know, without question. Right. That kind of authority, if misused, can create, well, fertile ground for manipulation and abuse. It's not even necessarily about like conscious malicious intent, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's about how those power imbalances can cloud judgment and make it hard for people to speak up. Absolutely. Then you layer on top of that his role at the Master Seminary. He wasn't just teaching theology, he was shaping the minds of future church leaders. Right. Further extending his sphere of influence. And let's not forget the financial aspect. Right. The sources mention that Lawson allegedly used funds to you know, facilitate this relationship. Was there any indication of how that might have been possible without raising eyebrows? Well, the world of ministry, especially within these larger institutions, often involves significant travel and speaking engagements. Right. It's not uncommon for pastors and leaders to have a certain degree of financial autonomy in those areas. Which makes sense to a point. Right. You don't want to bog people down with every little expense report. Right. But at the same time, that autonomy, especially when combined with, you know, the kind of authority we've been discussing. Right. It can create opportunities for misuse. Precisely. And when you factor in the inherent power imbalances within these religious institutions, Wait. where questioning leadership is often discouraged or even seen as a form of like spiritual rebellion, right. it becomes even easier to see how these kinds of situations can fester in the shadows. It's like that saying, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Right. When things happen in secret, 
it's easier for those in power to, you know, kind of exploit the system. And that's why the lack of transparency from these institutions is so concerning. Mm. The sources suggest a deafening silence from Trinity Bible Church, Grace Community Church, even ministries like Ligonier and G3, where Lawson was, you know, a respected figure. Right. We touched on those whispers of whistleblowers earlier. Right. The fact that Protestia even brought it up, even though they couldn't confirm those claims, is telling. It suggests that there might be more to the story than, I don't know, than meets the eye. It paints a disturbing picture, doesn't it? Mm. If those whispers are true, it means that there were people who potentially tried to raise concerns about Lawson's behavior, but they were ignored, silenced, right. or maybe even punished for speaking up. And if that's the case, it speaks to a systemic issue within these organizations. It's one thing for an individual to, you know, kind of abuse their power. But it's a whole other level when the institutions themselves become complicit in that abuse. Right. By protecting their image over the well-being of their members. It's a sobering thought. And it raises questions about whether these institutions are truly equipped to handle these situations with the level of transparency and accountability that's needed. And to be fair, this isn't just an issue within religious institutions. Right. We've seen similar patterns play out in politics, entertainment, academia, Anywhere there are power dynamics at play. Exactly. It's a human problem. But that doesn't mean we should just shrug our shoulders and accept it, right? Right. We need to keep asking these tough questions, holding institutions accountable, and demanding better. Okay, so we've talked about Lawson's position within these organizations, the power dynamics, the potential for abuse, and the, you know, concerning lack of transparency. But before we move on, I want to circle back to something that really struck me as we were, you know, prepping for this deep dive. The Protestia article specifically mentioned that Lawson's connection with the woman in question stemmed from her being part of Grace Community Church, not directly as his student at the seminary. Right. Why do you think they made that distinction? That's a detail that could easily be glossed over, but it's actually quite significant. It speaks to the reach of Lawson's influence, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. This woman, even though not directly his student, was still within his sphere of authority. Right. Part of the congregation he led. It adds another layer to the power dynamic, doesn't it? It does. We know that, you know, she was an adult. But when you can consider the context, her being part of his congregation, potentially having known him for years, his position of spiritual authority, it raises questions about consent, coercion, and the potential for abuse. Absolutely. It reinforces the need to look beyond just the legal definition of adulthood in these situations. Yeah. Spiritual authority, particularly within these, you know, tightly knit religious communities, can create a level of implicit power that's difficult to navigate, especially for those who are new to the faith or who have a history of trauma. It's like trying to untangle a really complicated knot. You've got the power dynamics, the institutional influence, and then the very personal, often messy realities of human relationships. And we can't forget about the court of public opinion, which often rushes to judgment without fully understanding the complexities. Oh, absolutely. This case has sparked, you know, intense debate about whether or not the woman's identity should be revealed. Right. And it's a tough one. On one hand, you have the argument for transparency and holding both parties accountable. Right. But on the other hand... There's the very real concern that exposing her could lead to further harm, Mm. especially given the power imbalance and the often, you know, vicious nature of online judgment. It's a classic ethical dilemma, Mm. and there's no easy answer. It forces us to ask ourselves some difficult questions. (laughs) When does the public's right to know outweigh an individual's right to privacy? Mm -hmm. How do we balance the pursuit of truth with the need for compassion and understanding? It's a tough needle to thread. Ah. And there's no easy answer, but it feels like these are conversations we need to have. We do, too. Because this isn't just about Steve Lawson. It's about how we navigate these complex issues of power, responsibility, and grace in a world that's increasingly interconnected and transparent. I think what strikes me most about this whole deep dive is the sheer complexity of it all. There's the initial shock, the anger, the calls for accountability. But beneath all of that are these deeper questions about institutional power, individual responsibility, and the often, you know, messy realities of human relationships. And those questions don't have easy answers. Right. But that doesn't mean we stop asking them. It's in the grappling, the wrestling with these uncomfortable truths that we learn and grow both individually and as a society. Well said. So as we wrap up this deep dive into the Steve Lawson situation, we're left with more questions than answers. Or 
we always? Right. But maybe that's okay. Maybe the real value of this exercise is in the questioning itself. In acknowledging that these situations are rarely black and white. Right. There's a lot of gray area. And it's in that gray area where we have to learn to navigate with empathy, critical thinking, and a healthy dose of humility. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for coming along on this deep dive with us. Remember, this is just the starting point. Keep asking those tough questions, keep digging deeper, and keep engaging in these important conversations. We'll be back next time with another deep dive into a topic that matters. Until then, keep learning and keep exploring. All right, so we've talked about the allegations against Steve Lawson, the institutions involved, and power dynamics at play. But like, what's been the reaction from the, you know, from the public? I mean, this isn't just some isolated incident. It's, it's sparking conversations all over the place, especially online. You're telling me, right? And those online conversations, particularly the user comments attached to the Protesty article, offer a fascinating. Uh... I know it's a window into how this story is resonating with people, both inside and outside of those you know, affected communities. Right. We've got this mix of anger, disappointment, calls for accountability. I mean, some folks are even defending Lawson, which is oh yeah wild to me. It's like this whole thing is a mirror reflecting back how we view power, accountability, mm -hmm. you know, even forgiveness in the digital age. It's interesting you say that because um, one of the most striking things about these comments is the range of emotions being expressed. You know, you've yeah. got people who feel deeply betrayed by loss in someone they viewed as, I don't know, a spiritual mentor, yep. a pillar of their community. That sense of betrayal can be incredibly painful. Oh, yeah. And and often manifests as as anger, disillusionment. And it's not just anger at Lawson, right? Some of the comments seem to, I don't know, place a lot of blame on the woman involved. Even though, I mean, we know very little about her or her side of the story. That's right. And it highlights, you know, persistent double standard when it comes to infidelity and accountability. Mm. There's this tendency to, I don't know, demonize the other woman right. while minimizing the man's role and the power dynamics that might have been at play. It's like they can't hold those two ideas in their heads at the same time. Yeah. And then you have like the whole debate about whether or not her identity should be revealed. <sighs> the comments are completely split on that one. Yeah, that's a really, I don't know, it's a thorny issue. Yeah. On one hand, you know, transparency is important, especially when it comes to holding people in positions of power accountable for their actions. But on the other hand, we have to consider the potential harm of exposing someone who might be, you know, more vulnerable, both legally and within their own community. It really puts a spotlight on how we as a society handle these situations, right? Yeah. Particularly in the digital age where information spreads so quickly. Oh, yeah. And judgment can be incredibly swift and often unforgiving. It raises questions about the limits of privacy in the public sphere and whether our desire for like instant information and accountability sometimes overshadows the need for empathy, due process, you know, the presumption of innocence. Right. It's it's a tough needle to thread. And there's no there's no easy answer, but it feels like these are conversations we need to have. Because this isn't just about Steve Lawson. It's about how we navigate these, you know, these complex issues of power, responsibility and grace in a world that's increasingly, you know, interconnected and transparent. Well said, I think. I think what strikes me most about this whole deep dive is, um, I don't know, the sheer complexity of it all. Right. You know, yeah, the, yeah. This, the initial shock, the anger, the calls for accountability. But like beneath all of that are these deeper questions about institutional power, individual responsibility mm -hmm. and and the often, you know, messy realities of human relationships. And those questions don't have easy answers. Right. But like you said, that doesn't mean we stop asking them. Right. It's in the grappling, the wrestling with these uncomfortable truths that we learn and grow both individually and as a society. Well said. Well, as we wrap up this deep dive into the Steve Lawson situation, yeah. I think, you know, we're left with more questions than answers. But um, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe the real value of this this whole exercise is in the questioning itself. Right. All right? right. And acknowledging that these situations are are rarely black and white. There's a lot of gray area. Lots of gray area. And it's in that gray area where we have to learn to navigate with you know, with empathy, with critical thinking mm -hmm. and and a healthy dose of humility. 
I think that's a good place to leave it. Yeah, I think so too. Well, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on this deep dive with me. Always a pleasure to to chat about these things with you, and you know, hopefully, we've given our listeners something to to think about. Always a pleasure to be here. And for our listeners, remember, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Keep asking those tough questions. Keep the conversation going, and we'll uh, we'll catch you next time for another deep dive. Fight strength, feel the pace, we'll never fall.